So some of us were profoundly disturbed by the results of last evening's contest. Clearly, this is not a Wolverine room. But Muge and I have spent so much time at the University of Michigan together that the results of the NCAA championships were not exactly the thing we would be celebrating. But the reason I mention this is that we just conferred, <clears throat> and there's a problem. Because at Michigan, when you say that someone, something begins at 4 o'clock, you really begin at 4.10. And that is Michigan time. It's always 10 after the hour. If it's on the hour, if it's on the half hour, you start on the half hour. So you really need a lot of local knowledge in order to participate in Michigan well. Uh, but Michigan is abandoning that tradition, Muge has told me, despite the interests of engineers. So we are going to start closer to the start of the hour to honor the fact that we are at Brown, not still at Michigan. So welcome to you all. My name is Michael Kennedy. It is my great pleasure to be able to welcome Muge Gocek, who will be speaking about gender and nationalism in Turkey and Kurdistan today. But before I introduce our speaker, I wish to thank a number of people, in particular Yasemin Bavbek and Svenja Kopichuk for working with me in organizing the many events surrounding these encounters Muge will enjoy while here. And in particular to enhance our burgeoning historical and cultural political sociology that had one of its signal starts last December. I'd also like to thank Middle East Studies for their support of this visit. I'd like to thank my colleagues at the Watson Institute, some of whom I can barely see through the glass, and who gives double thumbs up, uh, for all of their enduring and most professional support. But above all, I want to thank Muge for being willing to come join us here. Given the number of issues Muge engages, and the number of people whom she supports, it's simply remarkable that she can be with us too. So thank you, Muge. If you can hear a note of familiarity in my voice, it's because you're a good listener. I have known Muge from the time of her interview to become an assistant professor at the University of Michigan, now over 30 years ago. Together with Julia Adams, Peggy Summers, George Steinmetz, Bill Sewell, and others in the sociology department, along with colleagues in anthropology and history, including Jeff Ely and Ron Suni, who were just here last December, we were part of a relatively remarkable assembly of historical and cultural social scientists at that turn of the century at Michigan. But Muge was distinctive in that already awesome assembly in a number of ways. Of course, her scholarship leads. As a professor of sociology and women's studies at the University of Michigan, and editor of at least five volumes, most recently Contested Spaces in Contemporary Turkey, Environmental, Urban, and Secular Politics, and the author of at least three, is that right, substantial books, nothing more substantial than a volume this size, but of course a volume of this significance. Denial of Violence, Ottoman Past, Turkish Present, and Collective Violence Against Armenians, 1789 to 2009, is one of the most remarkable books to have been published in recent years. This volume has received substantial acclaim, and not only among those who care about the Ottoman past, the Turkish present, or collective violence against Armenians for more than 200 years. It has also won recognition by professional associations of cultural sociologists and comparative historical sociologists, among others. This volume is not only a rigorous history of a particular denial of violence, but it is an exemplar for showing how theory and history need to be combined 
in order to penetrate veils of denial, hiding truths of world historical significance. Muguet not only illuminates genocide, but how its denial depends on certain kinds of emotion and nationalism embedded in larger accounts of racism and modernity. Indeed, this particular historical account ought to inspire other approaches to other denials of truth, including those we are facing in our world most immediately. But frankly, that takes more courage than most academics have. And this is another thing we might learn from Muguet. Muguet may be the bravest immediate colleague I have ever had. Of course, it takes a kind of courage to challenge those who diminish others in a common workplace with their racism or sexism or other forms of exclusion. And Muguet, as I recall, would stand up for that immediate justice in her colleagueship, in her teaching, and in her mentorship. But in those years where she worked with other colleagues at Michigan, including Ron Suni, on a series of workshops with Armenian and Turkish scholars and those who studied those peoples and those lands, she faced conventions beyond the conventional, challenges beyond the conventional. Indeed, I'll never forget the day when in my capacity as Vice Provost for International Affairs, those who presumed to represent Turkish national correctness came to me to complain that Muguet was not being a proper representative of the Turkish national tradition and that she was violating all sorts of norms of Turkish national correctness. They asked me what we were going to do about it. <clears throat> and we did the proper thing. We supported Muge's pursuit of scholarship beyond nationalism's demands and defended the significance of scholarly integrity in the face of political threats. Institutions need to do this, but they can only do it when we have scholars like Muge who are willing to pose those questions and research those issues that can disturb those who depend on denials of truth for their power and privilege. Unfortunately, things have not gotten easier from those first years of the 21st century, as we all know. But one thing certainly has improved over these last years, and that is the power of Muge Gocek's scholarly position and her recognition. And for that reason, I feel especially honored to be able to host her and to welcome her to Brown University to talk about gender and nationalism in Turkey and Kurdistan. Please help me welcome Muge Gocha. Well, thank you, Michael. I'm blushing so much. I don't know if I'll be able to deliver anything at this point. Uh, you were very kind. Uh, we miss Michael a lot. Uh, we had a great time together, and lots of adventures uh, with nationalists and all other people. Uh, then he up and left, and we still miss him at Michigan, but Michigan's loss is Brown's gain. Uh, so what can you do? It's nice to catch up again. And uh, also, I wanted to thank uh, Yasemin and Svenja for working with you. Uh, for preparing uh, this talk. And uh, this talk is uh, sort of important uh, for me because it's the first talk I'm giving on uh, the Kurds. Uh, I have worked uh, until now on the Armenians. Uh, that big brick of a book uh, is what came out of it, yes. Uh, and then what I realized while working on that book uh, was the violence against the Kurds. And, and I decided uh, to take that one on next. Uh, and that's what I'm going to be uh, writing a book on next. But uh, of course, I also had to uh, spend a year learning Kurmanju Turkish, uh, Kurdish, because as an ethnic Turk, uh, I could not 
be very imperialistic and uh, uh, pretend uh, to study from top down without knowing and mastering the language, which is a beautiful language and it has nothing whatsoever to do with Turkish, for those of you who think uh, uh, or claim it does. Um, so, uh, and you, those shall go nameless, you know who I'm talking about, right? So what was the origin of this talk? Uh, well, I was coming uh, to Boston and Michael said, well, come, and I said, well, I'm going to this other conference on gender and nationalism. I said, well, let me do something uh, relative because I do have like a strategic move in, in, in mind. But probably the most significant starting point was what happened in Afrin, at the Afrin Canton. Uh, what was uh, very disturbing to me is Afrin is one of the three cantons, uh, the, the Kurdish self-governing cantons uh, that uh, comprise Rojava. Um, and um, uh, the Turkish military literally went in um, and destroyed uh, and basically has occupied uh, um, Afrin. Uh, what didn't surprise me was the nationalism beyond, behind uh, Turkish state or the Turkish military. Uh, but what did surprise me was the support that the Turkish society um, literally uh, uh, provided for this. And that uh, way of, in a way, uh, uh, acknowledging and even enthusiastically supporting this violence against the Kurds was something uh, that I found deeply disturbing. Um, and what is also uh, very upsetting uh, about uh, this violence is that uh, these are basically being committed on lands uh, that are the ancestral lands of the Kurds. And, you know, the Turkish state uh, has no reason to be there, basically, even if you think about the borders, boundaries of Turkey. Um, so I tried to understand why this was the case. That took me uh, to, when I was thinking about it, I of course have written about the Armenians, so it took me to uh, consider the Armenian case. Uh, what was very interesting when I was uh, writing the book is that Ontologically, it was uh, whenever I read 350 memoirs to get a sense of, you know, how people interpreted violence and legitimated especially violence against the Armenians, um, what was very surprising was that Armenians uh, were never considered a part of the body politic. When people were talking about them, it was like they were there somewhere, you know, and it was not a part of... Uh, um, uh, of what they considered uh, to be Ottoman, so to speak. And what is very interesting is that there is Saadet Tin Pasha, who has been sent by the Ottoman Sultan uh, in 1890, uh, 1896, after the first Armenian massacres, to go and, uh, you know, sort of consult and lecture uh, to the Armenians as the victims and Kurds as the perpetrators. And he, we, by luck, have his diaries. And I use the diaries in the book. And what is very interesting is that he has uh, speeches uh, of he gave the Kurds and the speech he gave the Armenians. Uh, they are totally different uh, in tone. And that very interestingly demonstrates uh, what's going on. Basically, uh, he says to the Armenians, well, you know, hang in there. This is important. Uh, you, you know, you'll bring civilization, we'll all be part of this modern future. So you can see, you know, he's playing this modernity angle sort of with them to sort of keep uh, uh, their loyalty to the Ottomans uh, and not sort of uh, try to, uh, loyal, uh, to be loyal to the great powers. With the Kurds, it's a very different tone. He says, hey, we're brothers, we're Muslim. What are you guys doing? You know, the Sultan, uh, uh, decides there is uh, the, there are laws you know we all work on this together so the tone is like of you know one friend to another or one brother to another so th that was a very interesting thing and then you know we do know after that that uh, you know especially Abdul Hamid II had the you know 
Hamidiyah regiments, uh, you know, that were Kurdish cavalry um, and other um, things where at least some of the Kurdish tribes were made loyal uh, uh, and interacted with uh, in the Ottoman context. So then the issue becomes, uh, you know, they were a part of what is known as Millete Hakime, the dominant nation, the Muslims of the, of the, of the, of the Ottoman Empire. If that is the case, what happened in the transition from uh, the Ottoman Empire to the Turkish Republic? Why did it, uh, what, hap you know, what happened, why it happened? Uh, so that is going to be the first part uh, of my uh, talk will be on analyzing the uh, Turkish-Kurdish relations uh, during uh, the Republican era to see what is the pattern that develops in those relations. And then I'll turn on to the, uh, uh, and, and then I'll argue, I might as well give the, give the secret away. I argue for um, a term uh, called ontological nationalism, a nationalism which does not uh, leave any space uh, for the other or for another uh, to exist other than the dominant uh, uh, social group in a, in a country. Uh, and then I will go and uh, I will, in the second part, try to see how that ontological yeah, national... I might as well give the... <laughs> this <laughs> is cool. Sure yes, done. yes, that's <laughs> one. <laughs> how ontological nationalism uh, could be uh, basically destabilized. And I will use uh, intersectionality and postcolonial analysis to, to do that uh, in the second part. And uh, intersectionality is the gender and nationalism and the juxtaposition, of course, of Turkey and Kurdistan, uh, which hasn't been done uh, as openly and boldly uh, as I have here. What is very important uh, when you look at uh, the relationship uh, between uh, um, Turks and Kurds uh, is uh, pretty much, if you look at, um, if you take uh, the establishment of the Turkish Republic as the starting point, that is 1923, uh, it is marked uh, pretty much uh, by violence, uh, either uh, physical violence, uh, where you have literally um, um, from uh, um, the foundation of the Republic in 1923, uh, uh, rebellions of Kurds in 1924, 25, 26, 27, 29, 30, 34, 35, 37. We're talking this period of, of a lot of rebellions. And then, of course, uh, there is relative peace, uh, 38 to 78, because there's the Second World War and then there's the Cold War, so people you know, don't have time, I guess, uh, to do anything then. Then, of course, 1978 uh, to today, there is the revolutionary organization of PKK, uh, uh, Parti Karkeren uh, Kurdistan, that actually has continued, uh, you know, uh, has literally taken uh, violence against the Turkish state and the establishment of a Kurdish uh, state as their maxim and has been fighting. Uh, and they are actually uh, the Marxist and Leninist organization that Ibrahim Kalın, who is the uh, chief advisor of uh, President Tayyip Erdogan, uh, said that uh, they had nothing against the Kurds when they went into Afrin. They were after a Marxist-Leninist terrorist organization, hence PKK. Uh, but of course, he didn't say that. Uh, what is uh, then important is, of course, from then onwards, uh, we do have um, um, a lot of uh, violence. Uh, um, also very significant is the 2005 declaration of Öcalan uh, of uh, democratic confederalism, where he changes literally the Kurdish uh, uh, ideology uh, from uh, having a nation state to having uh, basically a, a confederate a democratic uh, structure uh, that is based on Radical democracy, ecology, and gender equity. So that is why gender sort of comes in in a very interesting way. But since then, uh, we have then, of course, the Justice and Development Party in Turkey, and there is back and forth peace process, doesn't work. And then in the end, of course, uh, 
um, it totally falls apart in 2016, 15, uh, 15, July 2015, and is still uh, in bad shape. All the Kurdish uh, journals, associations, uh, everything is uh, um, closed down. There's a lot of violence against the Kurds that we do not uh, publicly know of, but hear about. Uh, I was one of the signatories of the peace petition in J January 2016, as a consequence of which I now have the honor also of being a Kurdish guerrilla myself for having signed the, you know, the petition uh, without having to go to the mountains or doing any fights. Uh, and uh, as a consequence of which I can't go back to Turkey. Uh, so you can see that there is a lot of violence uh, on the one side. On the other side, there is political violence in the sense that there are attempts constantly by the Kurds to enter the Turkish body politic by forming one party after another uh, that keeps uh, being shut down after a couple of years. Uh, they never make it into the parliament initially as independents. Uh, okay, they can only make it in as independents. Uh, their immunity is taken off uh, in 1994-5 uh, uh, with the deputies uh, imprisoned. And more recently now, again, there is, of course, a HDP, uh, uh, the Dem uh, People's um, uh, Democratic Party, uh, that also made it for the first time as a party into the Turkish National Assembly by getting 10.75% of the votes and therefore going above the, the threshold uh, of 10 percent, which was why a lot of the Kurdish uh, uh, political uh, candidates uh, would go single, I mean, as, as or the ind independents rather than uh, together as a party because the threshold was so, of, of participation was so high. And that happened in June 2015. And the violence against the Kurds starts in Ju July 2015, right after that. Uh, so obviously, that was not a welcome move because it forced AKP, the Justice and Development Party, into a coalition. Uh, they did not want uh, Kurds uh, to have political power within, uh, you know, uh, the Turkish political system. And uh, especially after the July. 2016 alleged coup, uh, the, uh, the leaders uh, of the uh, HTP were arrested. Uh, they are now in, in, prison, in prisons. Uh, there are about, um, uh, I think, 80-some uh, uh, party members who are in prison, as well as about um, 1,500 officials uh, who are uh, uh, in pre-trial arrest, uh, and then they wait trial, and who knows when the trial will be. It could be a year, two years, you know, six months. So as you can see, there is definitely systemic violence uh, that is um, being there, uh, both at the level uh, physically uh, and also uh, politically. What is the reason behind this uh, is, of course, what, uh, what happened? Well, whatever happened, happened uh, before 1923. It happens literally between 1919 and 1923. And what I will be arguing here uh, is that it is during that time that the foundation myth of the Turkish Republic uh, is put together for the first time by Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, uh, who then shares this myth with his, uh, you know, at the Republican People Party uh, annual meeting in 1927 where he, for five days, goes on and gives this long uh, speech, probably broke a record at that point, given how long it was, uh, on his accounts of the independence struggle and what happened. By that account, uh, he established himself as the uh, sort of the hero, uh, even though when he uh, landed in Samsun on the 19th of May 1919, he had 72 people with him, but he says, he single-handedly sort of established the Turkish Republic. And then he told uh, the story in a way, of course, that favored his action and silenced other actions. So that is the foundation myth. According to this myth, 
there is only one social group, uh, one ethnic group uh, that put together the republic, and that is, of course, uh, the Turkish uh, nation, or the Turks uh, as a group. Now, what is very interesting is that if you look at what happened between 1919 and 1923, or even going back to 1915, there are uh, four uh, ethnic groups that claim Asia Minor or Anatolia as their uh, ancestral lands. Uh, there are the Greek Rum, uh, Kurds, Armenians, and Turks. So all these four, what happens? Of course, we know about the Armenian genocide and what happened to the Armenians. Uh, the Greek Rum first are uh, um, literally scared away in 1912 uh, and 13 uh, by uh, the special organization of the Young Turks, Teşkilatu Mahsusa, where Celal Bayar, who later became the president of uh, the Turkish Republic, played a very significant role in basically uh, um, using uh, militia uh, to uh, have a lot of uh, violence uh, against them, so they migrated all. About 300,000 of them left uh, for Greece. Uh, and then, of course, after, during the, you know, during the war of, uh, during the independence struggle, the Greek armies that came in were also ousted by uh, the Kemalist army. And as a consequence, that took care of the Greeks. Well, that leaves us with two ethnic groups, the Kurds and the Turks. What I'm arguing here uh, is that uh, what happens is that the Turkish Republic uh, was founded uh, uh, not by Turks alone, but by Turks and Kurds. And what happens is that with the foundation myth uh, and what I call ontological nationalism, the existence of Kurds in this uh, in the foundation of the establishment of the republic is totally erased. And I call that erasure ontological nationalism. It comes from uh, the concept of methodological nationalism, where people argue, uh, and this is used later by Ulrich Beck and Anthony Giddens, uh, they argue that in methodological nationalism, social scientists equate society with the nation state. And that is you know, why they always think and envision society within national borders. I take that um, a step further, and I call ontological nationalism um, the case when society uh, becomes uh, uh, equated with one ethnic group, in this case, the Turks. And as a consequence, uh, all others, in, in, and especially the Kurds, do not fit any longer. And it is this ontological uh, nationalism and the ontological violence that, in a way, legitimates this continuous violence against uh, the Kurds, who were uh, one of the two founding uh, groups, ethnic groups, of the Turkish Republic. How does this happen? Um, I didn't come upon it miraculously. If you look at, basically, uh, what happens, uh, um, the, uh, there is definitely uh, a promise of local sovereignty to the Kurds by the Kemalist forces, including Mustafa Kemal, from 1919 to 1923. In 1923, when the Lausanne Treaty recognizes Turkey's borders, and also when the Republic is founded, it is at that point that uh, the Turkish leadership stopped talking about Kurds totally. And they go back and they literally censor what happened between 1919 uh, until 1923. And that I call ontological violence. Uh, what was uh, the kind of violence that occurred? If you look at um, basically, uh, the, uh, for example, uh, uh, Mustafa Kemal, uh, who lands at, in Samson to start the independence struggle on 19th of May, 1919. From that point onward, uh, in June to September, we know that uh, they are uh, uh, anxious about uh, the activities of British Major Mr. Noel. And as a consequence, they say, well, the British are trying to foster uh, Kurdish independence. Uh, we have to stop that. It will not work. Uh, on September 1919, uh, 
Mustafa Kemal reports to American General Harbor that the British tried to start a war of brothers between the Turks and the Kurds with the intent to establish an independent Kurdistan, but the Kurds threw them out. So then there is definitely this worry that there is going to be an independent Kurdistan because there is a suggestion at the Sevres Treaty at the end of World War I and that there would be uh, an independent Armenia and an independent Kurdistan. In the case of the Armenians, they're pretty much decimated, so there's not enough there to put together anything. But obviously there are many Kurds in that uh, uh, part uh, that could definitely have their own state. What happens then uh, is um, what we see is the October uh, 1919 Sivas Congress, October uh, 1919 against the Amasya Protocol uh, with the, you know, Hayati uh, um, where the Istanbul government of the Sultan and the, Tur uh, the Kemalist government come together. And uh, later on the 1921 constitution, uh, all the way to in January 23, at the beginning of that, the Izmit meeting. And what is the main uh, sort of message, or at least uh, uh, the, the narrative until then? I'll just read you some of the things. Sivas Congress, parts of the Ottoman lands that are within our borders and that have an overwhelming uh, Muslim uh, majority will be comprising uh, the Turkish Republic. Then it says uh, in Amasya Protocol, Articles 1 and 2, and what was later censored from historical accounts says, the lands of the Ottoman state comprise, comprise the lands where Turks and Kurds live. Kurds are the inseparable element of Ottoman society. In addition, it was decided that in order for the Kurds to ascertain their sovereignty in development, it would be permitted for them to be supported in relation to their race, legal system, and social rights with the intent to improve their well-being. At the 1921 Constitution, Kurds and Turks as founding partners, um, where uh, especially in Articles 12 and 14, representatives are chosen by the local populace, uh, and uh, governors would interfere then. There is what they're suggesting interestingly enough, is what uh, PKK and Abdullah Jalan now has suggested in 2005. There is self-governance from the grounds up, uh, basically, and as a consequence, uh, Kurds will be able to uh, uh, be independent where they are. And this becomes most evident in the Izmit meeting, which didn't uh, get uh, published in its entirety till 1993. It says, Mustafa Kemal states, and I quote, as required by our 1921 constitution, a type of sovereignty forms there anyhow. Hence, whichever administrative dis division has a Kurdish populace, they will govern themselves independently. In addition, when one talks about the populace of Turkey, they, the Kurds, need to be mentioned along the Kurds as what well, the Turks as well. When they are not mentioned, it would be possible for them to cause trouble from this. Now the National Assembly is constituted by the deputies of both Turks and Kurds, and these two elements have unified all their interests and destinies. So they know that this is a joint endeavor. It will not be right to start drawing a separate border. Uh, and all this, of course, is uh, very important uh, because in 1924, once the Republic is founded, Article 88 says the populace of Turkey will be considered, without regard to religion or race, Turkish as citizens. And suddenly there you see the shift, ontological shift. I argue it is this ontological violence and the ontological nationalism uh, that is so crucial in understanding uh, uh, Turkish history and the violence, legitimation of violence against the Kurds. This isn't, of course, only, this ontological nationalism doesn't only work in the case of Turkey alone. One could argue that we have the same uh, here in the United States. If you think about uh, the foundation myths or narratives of uh, the United States, you can argue that the founding fathers uh, and all uh, the rest uh, always uh, privilege uh, of course, the narratives of the white settlers. Uh, it, but there are three elements uh, that I would argue make up uh, the United States uh, for what it is. The other two, of course, are the 
uh, Native American lands that have been plundered away, uh, obviously, and also African, Ameri uh, African American labor that was also exploited. It is the combination of the three um, that uh, one needs to also look. And I think that we, too, uh, commit ontological violence by not including the other two. I mean, you know, at Brown, I was just saying, you know, the Narragansett obviously are here. Brown was a slave owner, so obviously there's a lot of slave labor that went in here. I gave a talk, uh, a course at Michigan, where I looked at the native lands there, the uh, um, Ashinabe uh, tribe. Uh, and, you know, these are also things that we need to think about and how those then not only justify the violence, ensuing violence uh, in American society, but also uh, how it turns, uh, again, uh, these African Americans and Native Americans into minorities uh, that are stigmatized. Likewise, I think this ontological violence uh, turned the Kurds uh, into uh, uh, stigmatized uh, social groups. So this is terrible and depressing. But at least we, I sort of identified something. But I'm not going to stop there. I mean, obviously, if there is such uh, ontological violence and nationalism, how do we destabilize it? And it is in that context that I turn then to uh, my second part of my talk, where I talk about uh, intersectionality uh, uh, that sort of first came out as an analytical tool by Kimberly Crenshaw based on also uh, Patricia Hal Collins's idea of matrix of domination, where uh, uh, they try to strive for uh, to overcome the public invisibility in this case of uh, black women, who do not fit into the civil rights movement uh, run by black men or the women's movement uh, run by white women. So it is therefore uh, the intersection that they very much uh, look at uh, to bring that up. So. That idea of intersectionality has been used to destabilize hegemony. And I thought in this case, then, I could also use gender and look at how it intersects with uh, nationalism. And that is, hence the title, the gender and nationalism part. The second uh, part, of course, has to do with uh, postcolonial and critical analysis, where we know that in order to sort of destabilize power structures, uh, you have to uh, take on two projects. Uh, you have to look at uh, the margins uh, in order to create uh, and generate alternate knowledge and alternate experiences and bring them into the discourse. At the same time, you have to destabilize uh, the hegemonic discourse by uh, criticizing it and putting it in conversation with the margins. That is why uh, I decided that in addition to the, the, the sort of Turkish hegemonic nationalism, I would bring in Kurdistan and Kurds in conversation with each other so that that way we could see how violence uh, is not only justified but legitimated and reproduced over time. And that is uh, the second part uh, where I looked at um, Turkish and Kurdish women jointly through history. Because if you look at the literature, people talk about nationalism in Turkey, they assume it's Turkish nationalism. I mean, it's like here when we talk about you know, something, you assume it's all whites. I mean, nobody says whites, though, because that's normalized and naturalized, right? Uh, you only sort of identify something if it's non-white, black or you know, Native American or something else. S likewise, in Turkey, when there is general discourse, you know that it pertains to the Turks because they are the majority, nobody says so. Only when difference is marked, then you talk about others. Well, what happens if you bring the two together? Uh, so that was what I did. I based it on works, of course, by many uh, Kurds and Turks, uh, also soberly knowing that I come from uh, uh, the positionality of an ethnic uh, Turk myself, but hopefully I have been able to put that in context somehow by studying the Armenians, and I talked about you know, how, what a process that was. Uh, um, when you look at the 19th century in Ottoman society, you have first, uh, because of the reforms, 
modern, modern reforms. Uh, Armenian women, Turkish women, and uh, Kurdish women all forming women's organizations with the intent to make women's lives better. Uh, but there isn't any competition or anything. They're all out there. Of course, uh, the idea there is to, with the intent to lead, educate, and provide charity. So those are the, the uh, intents. Uh, and what is interesting is non-Muslim women, of course, appear more frequently in uh, urban public spaces, uh, and women uh, and Muslim women gradually uh, follow suit. Uh, um, of course, uh, Armenian women are initially the leaders, as, as Lerna Ekmekçoğlu and Melissa Bilal have uh, put, because they are uh, the non-Muslims uh, formulate uh, the Ottoman bourgeoisie initially. But of course, uh, with the genocide and the ensuing violence, uh, the Armenian women, they're also very active in the arts, theater, and such. That is all erased. Uh, so that in Turkey, when you start uh, sort of history of women's movement, you start with Turkish women. With respect to Kurdish women, um, there is, uh, in 1919, Kürte Ali Nisvan Cemiyeti, that is founded by Dr. Encam Yarmouki, daughter of Kürt Hacı Mustafa Yarmouki Pasha. So these are mostly upper class educated women in all arenas. So what happens uh, after uh, uh, after uh, the you know World War One, followed by the independence uh, struggle that leads uh, to then uh, the foundation of the Turkish uh, Republic, uh, that is when uh, mention of non-Muslim and Kurdish women disappear. Turkish women are there because Halide Edip Adivar is a sergeant in the military. Kara Fatma is a militia leader. So we have some token, let's say. Uh, Turkish women, and then we have, uh, of course, uh, the daughters of, uh, adopted daughters of Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, like Sabiha Gökçen, who was actually an Armenian orphan, but then became uh, a pilot, uh, trained as a pilot, to, as an image of the modern Turkish woman, and went and bombed, uh, you know, uh, Kurds in 1938. So there is uh, sort of those models uh, initially. And what happens uh, later, of course, is with 1923-24, uh, we see, uh, and 1930s are very important because that is when Turkish women's uh, uh, attempts to form an independent women's movement are, you know, totally stopped by the the state, and uh, state feminism takes over. Turkish state feminism takes over, where uh, the feminist state feminists basically replicate and regurgitate uh, uh, state uh, ideologies. Uh, why at first uh, there is the Women's People's pa uh, People Party that is founded in June 1923 by Nezihe Muhittin, but uh, the governor doesn't give her permission uh, to establish it because women don't have the right to vote. So uh, they sort of, she establishes an organization instead. They stop this whole process because of the Sheikh Said rebellion happening, uh, you know, in Kurdistan. So you see that that is used as an excuse uh, to stop the women's movement. Then in 1930 and 34, women are given the right to vote from top down, not bottom up. And as a consequence, once that has happened, uh, uh, the Republican People Party officials sort of force uh, uh, the Turkish Women's Union that was independent uh, founded by Nezia Muhittin, to close down. And they say, because you were there for the right to vote, you got the vote, so there's nothing more for you to do. If you want to do things, go do charity work or be in the, the party. Initially, 35 women entered the parliament uh, more than for a long time, uh, proportionally more than uh, they do after uh, in the National Assembly. But there is no indication of you know, no impact uh, uh, with respect to women's movement. So that is uh, sort of uh, what happens. Uh, what is then important uh, is sort of then they are demobilized, uh, you know, uh, after the right to vote. Uh, and um, in the 1940s uh, to the 60s, institutionalization of ontological nationalism, of course, through education, where 
uh, we get the official narrative uh, then, and then the Turks are the heroes, everybody else is the enemy and not a part of the Turkish body politic, that becomes uh, very much instilled in uh, future generations. Then, of course, uh, it is during that time also that fem female representation in the National Assembly drops down to like 0 0.7 to 1.3 percent. So you see the state and uh, feminism, and whenever the state takes a role, I mean, this came to me a lot uh, when I was uh, um, working on the sort of, you know, the Armenian genocide, and there were the Asala and other murders by Armenian terrorists of Turkish diplomats, and the state protested, and then they called the universities and have the universities protest. So you have one bizarre university saying, we protest this, as if, you know, that's what they had to do, which is not what the university is supposed to do, but uh, they are seen as tools of the state. And also, you have women marching and placing like black wreaths, you know, in, on the French embassy or others. So they are also used as tools of the state. What is very important in this case is that Turks, Turkish women, therefore, take over basically the two problems, the two sort of exclusions that both the Turkish state and military have uh, against Kurds and against Islamists. Uh, the headscarf affair and everything leads to a fragmentation in the Kurd Turkish movement so that they do not develop in line uh, with uh, either Kurdish women or with Islamist women. And that leads in a way to the fragmentation uh, of the movement uh, and it's, I think, demobilization at the time now is, is based on that. Whereas Kurdish women uh, on the other side, uh, starting with uh, 1978 foundation of the PKK and later, uh, uh, you know, in 1984 taking action, uh, go to the, uh, you know, mountains as guerrillas, face there in addition, of course, to Turkish uh, violence, uh, they also face uh, chauvinism and uh, patriarchy as well. And this is a hard time uh, for Kurdish women. They later start having their own regiments uh, that, um, you know, in a way enables things uh, to be better. When you look at the Kurdish women's sort of mobilization and movement, there are the city ones that in the 1980s, both the Turkish and Kurdish women are active in the cities, found their own organizations, journals, and the like. This is more intellectual. And then there are, of course, those who are fighting as a part of a PKK. Uh, those are the others. So this is like the two axes on which uh, both develop. With the foundation of the PKK and the ensuing mile, uh, uh, violence, you also get martyr mothers, mothers, mothers of martyrs on both sides of the soldiers who die the Turkish side, and of course of the uh, um, militants, uh, guerrillas who die, their mothers. I mean, so these are uh, very similar in a way. And they, of course, polarize things even more because of, of, of what is uh, going on uh, in general. 1990s is uh, when there is massive uh, Turkish state violence. Uh, especially thousands of Kurds Muslim men are kidnapped, killed, and tortured in prisons. Uh, Saturday mothers emerge, uh, so that is an important development, very much similar to the Saturday uh, black mothers in black in Argentina, uh, uh, Plaza de Mayo, uh, to protest the dirty, dirty war. And uh, what is important then, probably in that context, uh, is the headscarf issue becomes a big issue and the Turkish, secular Turkish women and headscarf women are separated. And this, I think, also explains some of the anger that the Islamists uh, and uh, President Erdogan in particular have against the secularists because of this exclusion. Because what happens, obviously, is that when it is time then to let somebody in, they could have let the Kurds in or the Islamists in, and of course, with the Turkish Islamic synthesis, it's the Islamists that are let in that are ethnically Turkish rather than the Kurds. Whereas I would have gone with the Kurds, but then again, I'm not ruling anything. 
what is very important in 1999 is the peace mothers, because peace mothers are mothers striving for peace similar to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict of both Kurdish and Turkish mothers, uh, you know, who are uh, striving, uh, aiming to promote peace between Turkey's different ethnic groups. Uh, and they become more active in the 2000s, but again, uh, uh, not uh, uh, very quickly. Uh, and this is also when the Turkish and Kurdish uh, women's organizations start to communicate in earnest. And this is, I think, where the problem is. When the Kurdish women say, look, our priorities are language rights, torture, human rights violations, uh, and they especially complain about the village guards raping uh, women and such. Uh, Kurdish women say, uh, the Turkish women say, well, we don't care about those things, so they, they don't happen to us, so let's talk about domestic violence. And Kurdish women say, well, domestic violence is pretty low on our list. We have other things, you know, that are more urgent. And Things don't go anywhere because of that. And I think that is exactly the problem. What needs to be done uh, is that uh, for a movement, for the women's movement, which has the potential to overcome uh, the politicization and polarization to work, Turkish women have to, being in a more pos a dominant position, have to fully embrace uh, uh, the problems of Islamist women as well as Kurdish women as their own and strive to f solve those before turning to their own because solving those problems will make society more peaceful to start with. Well, this is much easier said uh, than done. I tried to say this uh, when we were working on a project on how with the coming to power on Justice and Development Party, women's participation in the public sphere has decreased, women's educational level has decreased, employment has decreased. So uh, um, I was trying to figure out with a colleague of mine whether uh, Turkish women were aware of this, what the secular women thought, uh, as well as what the Islamist women thought. Uh, and it was fascinating to find out there wasn't any gender consciousness, but also they did not at all think of each other, which was also very sad. So I gave a talk um, at the end of it, uh, and of course there were mostly secular women, because they were more active in the public space then. I said to them, unless uh, the Islamist women care about uh, and work on the secular women's issues and the secular women do the same with the Islamist women, we will not get anywhere. At that point, there was this roar. They all got up and they said, who are you running, you know, are you running for political office with the Islamist party? I said, what I say is common sense. That's what you learn in Women's Studies 101. But they weren't even willing to listen. Of course, things have changed since then. Uh, after the coming uh, to power of um, um, Justice and Development uh, Party in 2002. Uh, um, uh, uh, and then only in 2013 w were they able to make a uh, headscarf okay to wear in, in, you know, in public spaces. So the Islamist women have been incorporated. But I think if you look at at least how uh, this democratic confederalism is working out, it is much more potentially powerful to transform not only women's issues, but also democracy and other things uh, uh, because uh, of the way it has been formulated and because Kurdish women's experiences allows them to develop these new spaces. Uh, they are the ones, those practices are the ones that should be taken uh, as models by Islamist and Turkish women and are not. Uh, so I will sort of end there. What I wanted to uh, tell you is to give you a sense of how uh, the discourse narrative and the discussion changes dramatically when you bring uh, Turkish and Kurdish uh, women together. And that you could see this, I think, uh, uh, in its entirety. Uh, with hopefully uh, transformative uh, potential uh, 
uh, in both arenas. But more importantly, of course, uh, none of this uh, could happen unless we fully uh, talk about uh, the foundation myths in the Turkish Republic and how uh, Kurds suffered uh, so much uh, ontological violence uh, and their role in uh, the history of the Turkish Republic was erased, uh, leading to sustained violence since. That's how I'll end. Thank you. Sure, of course. And uh, I did, did just want to mention that, uh, in case you're not aware, this is being recorded, so. Okay. Yes, please, go ahead. So, thank you so much. This is, um, I'm not into Turkish studies, but I have tangential interest. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to understand um, the, the, the uh, Turkish government's inability to accommodate difference, difference of ethnicity. Um, so it eliminated two, and now you have the, the problem of the, of the Kurds. Um, does that also translate into inability to accommodate religious differences, like sex and so on, in, in Turkey? And if that's the case, why is it, uh, whether you say yes or no, I mean, whether that can be also uh, a model for understanding ethnic differences? Or is the problem of the Kurds really that there is a huge numbers of them across the border, and it can uh, uh, result in a sort of uh, Kurdistan? Well, of course, that's the problem. I mean, but Kurdistan, as Mustafa Kemal refers to it as Kurdistan, that's why I put Kurdistan in the title. Uh, with with the I mean the reformulation in 2005, uh, Kurds see as like this abstract imagined society that does not have any territorial base. So it's it's changed also, but the largest number of Kurds live in Turkey, uh, the ones across. So there are they're sort of all uh, separated among like four different uh, uh, countries. Uh, that of course has a big issue, and they, this isn't like. Uh, the Armenian genocide. We are not at war. They cannot be massacred. I mean, there are there are almost 17 to 20 percent of the population. So it has the exclusion is unsustainable. Uh, why? But they, I think, cannot go back unless they rewrite the Turkish foundation myth. They are not able uh, to to accommodate. Uh, you know, uh, the Kurds, the younger generations, of course, have no problem with it, but the whole justification of the Turkish Republic is based uh, on this exclusion. So that is the problem. And nationalisms always exclude, but uh, I almost think that excluding as the other almost is better than ontologically sort of, you know, erasing them or trying to erase them. You cannot do that. I mean, I was shocked when I first went to Kurdistan because I was looking at old Armenian uh, um, settle. I mean, uh, places um, of settlement. Uh, it is like another country. I mean, it is their country. And when they have these things, the military says, "Yasev ya terket," you know, either love it or leave it. I said, "Well, actually, this is more." appropriate that Kurds wrote this, that they are the ones, I mean, you know, they are here, it's their land. Who are you telling to leave? The Turks are the colonizers. They have, they should be the ones leaving. So that was so different uh, in appeal. And there, because I spoke Turkish with an Istanbul accent, they thought I was from the television. Uh, because they only hear the Istanbul accent in television. They say, you're a television star. I'm saying, <laughs> no, I hope not. Uh, but it was a very interesting there. I mean, you know, it is their country. We are not supposed to be there as Turks. And at least in the self-governance context, uh, you know, they are willing to work with, with the Turks. Uh, so I see no problem with that. But. Uh, I then again don't think the same way they do, obviously, and that's why I'm here and they're back there. Yes. So I have a question about this kind of early historical turning point. That yes. Um, you know, I don't know much about kind of the particulars of the case, although I see the there's been all kinds of contemporary pictures 
yes. fascinating in itself. Um, but as you tell the story, there's this moment where Turkey gets defined as sort of a bi-ethnic nation, yeah. and it very quickly sort of turns to mono-ethnic, right? Yeah. And I'm just imagining that probably the way that that looks on the ground is that there's like coalitions of political actors that are contesting and fighting over kind of how Turkey's going to get defined, right? Yes. And my question is like, does that on the ground politics actually matter, right? Is it, is it imaginable to have a future in which the bi-ethnic coalition sort of wins? Or is there something about the way that the, the national myth gets told or like the geopolitics of the region or state and society relations that sort of dooms that bi-ethnic understanding of the nation? That's a very good question. I mean, you know, I, I thought about that a lot. I mean, because obviously Kurds didn't disappear. They're, they're there. And of course, once they realize that they were offered all these things, the promises, and none of them were, you know, kept. They revolted for like 10, more than 10, 15 years just to get what was promised to them, right? Mm -hmm. But I think there, one part, of course, is uh, this is a time of extreme change, especially the Allied powers are there. The British are sort of provoking it. And uh, during the Lausanne Treaty, which I also worked on, uh, uh, the Armenians say to the uh, Kurds, you know, let's work together in, fun, fun, you know, forming a, a thing. And then uh, the Turks, uh, the Kurds basically split. Half the Kurds want to go along with the Turks. The other half uh, want to go with the Armenians. And of course, you can imagine who loses in the end. I mean, there is also some strife among the Kurds as to, and to this day, uh, uh, some uh, Kurdish tribes work with Turkey and benefit from it as a consequence, and others did not. Uh, during the Armenian genocide, most of them were there uh, massacring uh, um, the Armenians, but at other times, uh, of course, there were also uh, those who saved Armenians and helped them escape to Russia. So it's also not as crystal clear. I mean, I'm making it more dramatic than it actually is. But I think the issue is securitization. I mean, Turkey, like Stephen Kinzer actually wrote about, uh, uh, is, uh, had a very strong military presence. I mean, you know, if you look at the first five, uh, with the exception of Celal Bayar, I think the first eight presidents are all, uh, until Turgut Özal, uh, former military people. In addition, there are the coups that happen, you know, 60, uh, uh, 70 to 80, 90, 97, I mean, you know, with uh, a lot of, so you see what you have is uh, a strong military presence. Military is the one that fosters Turkish nationalism. Securitization becomes a big issue for them to basically usurp half of the annual budget every year. And because of securitization, and we know this, unfortunately, from the IR uh, literature, uh, is that, uh, you know, real politic always wins, uh, so that uh, people do not want to build these coalitions. Instead, they are always uh, portrayed as, as this violence, you know, potentially violent presence, which they're not, of course. But if you educate a nation for 80 years, 90 years, and brainwash it with that, it is then very difficult for them to see Kurds as who they actually are. Uh, I mean, similar to, you know, s s same stereotypes we have here uh, that work against integration. Yeah, yes. Um, so, uh, would you recommend that we uh, initiate dialogue between women of Turkey? Because like, on, on, one, on one hand, you have uh, the Islamist women uh, and you have uh, the nationalist women, and you have the seculars. So, and, and it's really hard to initiate dialogue without being labeled in Turkey, especially within the political context you have right now. Exactly. Because so many people are being imprisoned or like labeled as terrorists. When you like speak in favor of Kurdish people or Armenians, you're a terrorist. Yes. Or that makes things much more difficult than, exactly. than it should be. So, um, also women are always being the. Um, object in Turkish politics, like in headscarf, or like when you have um, when you have like nationalism, or in, in any other context. So it's really hard to have women as a subject of a political conversation and start something. So that kind of concerns me as to how one can initiate this kind of a conversation. 
And at the same time, uh, I was kind of surprised when Meryl Akshanar started a party, like in the nationalist um, ring yeah. too. Like it was really surprising to see a woman political leader to um, start something, but there was a huge opposition that came with it. So yes. how do you think yes. this can be overcome? Thank you. Those are all excellent questions. Starting with the last, Mera Lakshner, uh, I don't think is at all interested in women's rights. I mean, she is there first as a politician. Tan Suciler was also, you know, in uh, the first woman uh, prime minister for two years, 1993 to 95, and uh, she didn't do anything for women either. So, I mean, being a woman isn't enough, just like being a man isn't enough. I mean, it's the consciousness, gender consciousness, that's important. Can something be done? I totally agree about the politicization. When I gave talks on the Armenian genocide, the Armenian said to me, uh, you must be Armenian. Uh, they said, obviously, uh, you can't be an ethnic Turk. Your blood must have been civilized by an Armenian blood for you to be able to say the things you are saying. And then the Turks also say to, said to me, you must be Armenian. They said, you know, only a fool whose um, blood has been tainted by Armenian blood will say the stupid and crazy things you're saying, which was fascinating because it's the same argument on both sides, basically, right? So in a way, that is the problem. Is, uh, for me, all I want to is uh, create a, a space, or at least by putting the, the, by, in a way, strategically telling the stories together to create this commonality on which we can build things. But it's very utopic at the time, I agree. I mean, that's why when I used to go to Turkey and give the talks, they thought I was an Armenian. Then I thought, you know, with the Islamist women, I, I you know, talked that they should be included too. So they thought I was running for office with the AK party. You know, I get all of that too. It's very hard. Uh, what can be done, youth is very important, obviously, because they are not as prejudiced uh, as uh, the older people. And what I'm also very impressed by uh, this idea of democratic confederalism is, is you know, it's a very radical uh, movement that basically uh, wants to take on all oppressions. If you can even get other two groups to read about that, that will be the first step. Uh, Maybe we can have like little reading groups or something. But I don't know what to do because I can't go back to Turkey. So I have to leave them on their own. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. 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 And the Islamists are taking on the Kamalists. But I'm interested, sort of, in um, the intersection between AKP and a, a, a Kurdish identity or a, a Kurdish nationalism. And ah. sort of one of the sort of the way I uh, what I've read about. Popular appeal of the RQP is that, and the way this is this is talked about in a number of Islamic countries is they uh, they have an appeal. Their base often is rural to urban migrants. You know, yeah. Yeah. You know, and this has a lot of cash readings in the Kurdish region. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm curious to hear the, uh, your thoughts. And this relates directly to even the women's issue. Is what are the, the kinds of inroads RQP has made? Well, I mean, it is very interesting because uh, in uh, the way uh, Tayyip Erdogan and AKP uh, envisage themselves, uh, it, they are religious. Islam is first, Turkey is second. So they put religion before ethnicity. They, that is what they thought they could do with the Kurdish regions. They could incorporate them into the body politic with them totally suppressing, the Kurds suppressing their Kurdish identity and being there as Muslims. I mean, people say, for example, we've always had Kurds in the parliament. Yes, we did. But none of them came out and said, hey, I'm a Kurd. 
you know, and I'm the deputy until uh, Leila Zana in the 1993 and, and, and thereafter. So what's important is that can you have the Kurds there, I mean, you know, in a way privileging their ethnic identity. That is when things fell apart because uh, Kurds were not willing to do that. Although there are some Kurds who put religion before their ethnicity that do vote for AKP still. But they are the minority now. I mean, you know, or they were in the last elections. And uh, of course, one other thing that I didn't talk about that unites all the women in Turkey is because of the neoliberal turn. There are the consumer women, uh, or Hannah Arendt will call them the bystanders, you know, who like to go to the malls, shop, don't engage at all in politics. I mean, they can come together maybe to talk about fashion. Uh, but they are the ones, of course, that continue unabated uh, and are not going to change anything. Uh, but other than that, uh, we did, uh, I did a study in Turkey in 1990-91. We asked, uh, how would you define yourself? To this day, half the people in Turkey define themselves as Turks first. The other half define themselves as Muslims first. So you can see there the ethnic and religious identities still intention even among the Turks. Uh, and nobody, of course, said they were Kurdish because I don't know. That wasn't, I mean, in 1990s, there weren't many. They were mostly in prison. Yes? So in Turkey, in schools, we always, we were taught that this narrative of, like, the, the imperial, imperial powers are trying to dismantle our country, like, yes. during the, the establishment of the Republic. And that's why Ataturk had to, unite everyone under this like Turkish national identity because you know like the foreign powers were manipulating the, the ethnic groups. Yes. So even now that's how like they reasoned this like nationalism, the ontological nationalism we talked about. And even now with like the Afrin operation we see like oh the US is supporting the P the PKK, like the Kurdish forces and this is this is not about like our race or ethnicity issue, this is like our our security. We have to like unite our country. Exactly. So how do you respond to these arguments? Because I know that even some leftist people with that with the African operation are like supporting the, the operation because yes. we have yes. to fight against the US and like the foreign powers. It's not about the Kurds. So well there is the anti Americanism that goes yeah. into there and the third worldism that sort of follows, of course. That's a very a good perceptive way of, of seeing things. Well, the problem there is, uh, I mean, first, we have to recognize these are the ancestral lands of the Kurds. They are not our lands. I mean, if you look at the map, yes, half of the country is ethnically Turkish because we got rid of uh, the Armenians and the Greeks that were there. But the other half is mostly Kurdish. But we do not even allow the word Kurd or allowed the, the Kurdish language for a very long time. We always say Southeast. We don't even say Kurdistan. That's why I said Kurdistan, you know, because we first have to acknowledge that these are different people. They are not ethnically Turkish. I mean, you know, that is the first step, uh, you know, and then maybe you can start creating a space unless we do that. It doesn't look good. I mean, you know, this violence isn't going to abate. You cannot change people from who they are ethnically. It's not possible. Uh, so as a consequence, I do not know what the Turkish uh, state, well, I argue that one of the reasons why they use violence in this book, uh, why the book on Armenian genocide is basically that is the foundational violence of the Turkish Republic. Uh, they committed the Armenian genocide. Nobody was held accountable for it. And the people, the perpetrators then became the rulers of the Turkish Republic. And as a consequence, they normalized the violence. So whenever there's a problem in Turkey, the first instinct everybody has to solve problems is to turn to violence. I mean, that is what also we have to stop from using violence uh, as a way to solve issues as well. And this is, of course, very hard to say in this uh, time and age, especially because of neoliberalism that has polarized, you know, social groups so much that we have such violence everywhere now. 
And, you know, but of course we care about the Turkish situation because literally people are being killed all the time. I do not have the answer. Uh, I wish I did. All I'm trying to do is create a space within which we can talk about these things because that's what we did with the Turkish-Armenian workshop, uh, scholarship workshop. Uh, we started in uh, the year 2000. We're still doing it 18 years later. We have created their space where Turks and Armenians are able to talk to each other and talk about things together. It's creating such a space, again, in the Kurdish context that would help, where you do not impose on Kurds what you want them to do. You have them there as uh, equal partners and respect them. Uh, that is probably the first solution that I, as an academic, can do. Yes? Yes. I was wondering how the outside powers may convince or pressure the military in terms of the, um, giving the right to Kurds or convincing or pressuring whatever yes. you, you know, Kurds would like to use. Yeah. What do you think about that? Do they have a responsibility or any influence or power? Uh, well, I mean, this is uh, the, the major problem also with the Armenian genocide in acknowledgement. Uh, is it going to be through uh, pressure from the outside? Will it be through internal dynamics? I always think that it is uh, domestically these things have to be settled and questioned. Uh, and I don't think uh, we are anywhere near uh, that uh, in terms of, uh, of the military. They still, as I'm sure you know, uh, um, very much use uh, people's uh, Especially, they have a very Spartan system, uh, uh, so they know who the top leaders are going to be ahead of time. Like, and the military cadets who show the most uh, potential have their lineages uh, literally examined to see who their grandparents, great-grandparents, and all were. And then they find out that some were Kurds or even poor Turkish officials who had the kids born in Kurdistan because they were serving there. But even that is enough of a stigma. Uh, or Armenian ancestry, they would literally expel those cadets and wouldn't let them stay in that uh, system. I mean, if you have that level of exclusion uh, and, and, and treatment uh, of you know, non-Turks in that way, I don't know how you would change it. Uh, um, that would require a lot uh, of transformation. And I don't know if the the Turkey uh, military is able to do that because they have justified their existence for so long on grounds of securitization and, and Kurds as sort of this violence force. But as you know, uh, with President Erdogan, the Turkish military has lost its power uh, a lot. So maybe it's more important uh, to have the Islamists work on uh, being less uh, discriminatory. Uh, than the military, because they seem to be uh, having um, much more uh, influence at the moment. Uh, but uh, that is uh, very hard, I agree. Uh, but look, I'm able to give a talk at least and open the space. So hey, who knows? Yes, go ahead. Do you have any input on the recently published database of genealogy and <laughs> well, that was fascinating because, uh, as you know, uh, or you don't know, uh, President Erdogan is of Georgian descent, so he's not Turkish either. So we have no idea whether this was a postmodern move or what they were planning to do. I mean, you know, because if you think about because of the Islamic, uh, Turkish Islamic synthesis, what is disturbing in Turkey is how the nationalists Turkish nationalists and Islamists are working together uh, to, you know, uh, approve of this violence against the Kurds. Uh, maybe they just want everyone to be anxious. Uh, I could not understand why they did that, no. My brother sent uh, our things, though. He says, hey, in case you're interested, this is where we came from. I mean, we try very hard because of all these accusations. I'm sure now people will think I'm Kurdish. I'm not. It would be fine if I were, but, uh, you know, I am, unfortunately, ethnically Turkish through and through. Yes? Um, my question, my question is, uh, uh, is also methodological. Sure. When you were looking at the 
looking at the Kurdish nationalists and Kurdish women nationalists as well, were you just uh, looking at people who were in the uh, territory of modern Turkey, or were you also looking at Kurds in, in other countries? And was that a hard decision for you, and how did you resolve well, I mean, that was resolved for me uh, because I only looked at the Kurds uh, in, uh, it's called Bakur, you know, north uh, in, in Turkey, uh, in Turkey, not everybody, because, of course, uh, I learned Kurmanchu and there is other uh, uh, dialects of, 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 of Kurdish that I didn't know. So I didn't look at Iran, Iraq, Syria uh, at all. I only focused on uh, Kurds and most of them, because of colonization, also speak Turkish in addition to Kurdish. So that's why I chose those. And I have started reading memoirs, mostly of guerrillas and Kurdish women guerrillas, to get a sense. And I will be uh, combining that with some interviews about uh, their experiences of violence in Turkey. And we'll see what happens. But I'm at the very beginning. So you just got the framework. Yes. So how do you read the um, recent, the rapid um, transformations in the discourse? Like once there was a peace process, the Islamist women uh, seemed more open to the um, agenda of the Kurdish uh, uh, movement, Kurdish women's movement, but then it shifted all around. I mean, and yeah, this was yeah, also the yeah. time when the Kurdish women in Paris were assassinated. So exactly. how, how do you read this? I mean, does this ontological nationalism stay intact throughout the century, or are, are these moments of derailment, or these moments, uh... Well, the, the problem there is, yes, I mean, you know, why do you have these moments? Uh, I mean, to a certain degree, maybe uh, our party did come trying to uh, sort of, you know, open a new space and become a part of Europe or whatever. I don't know. I mean, given the trajectory, obviously, that wasn't the case. When the peace process started, I asked my Kurdish friends, I said, have you lost your mind? I mean, you know, you can't go to bed with the Turkish state. Who knows what they will do to you? They said, what are our options? There are no options, right? I mean, so if you're not, they're not going to say, no, we're not going to engage in the peace process with you. But I think it was a political move, and they did not intend it. And I think because of the close connection, just like taking State, Turkish state feminism as the model, I mean, also I think Islamist women are also uh, basically uh, in line with what AK Party tells them to do. And that is why there was an opening they had with the Kurdish women. And then when the AK Party officials said, enough, we're withdrawing, they withdrew. Because they do not have the backbone to stand on their own uh, in civil society. Unfortunately, I tell, I tell uh, my um, you know, colleagues, if you look at Turkey, when does civil society emerge in Turkey? If you look at it, uh, you start in 1912 with Tripoli, 1930 Balkan Wars, 1914-18 is World War I, 18 to 23 is independence struggle, 22 to 38 is literally establishing Turkey, 38 to 45 is Second World War, 45 to 89 is the Cold War. It's only after 1989-90 that Turkey sort of had the sort of wherewithal to ask, who are we, what's go going on, you know? Because before that, because of all the securitization and fighting, uh, they did not have any space to talk about these things. 1990, it's only 28 years. That's not a lot. Uh, in the collective, uh, you know, consciousness formation, if you think about it. So we're at the very beginning. Uh, you know, maybe with time they will be able to do that. But in order to do that, you have to have empathy and compassion for others. I mean, how could you get Turks to feel empathy to anyone, especially to Kurds when they have been brainwashed all these years? How could you oppose that? I think women have that capacity because of their, you know, uh, uh, compassion and willingness, at least, uh, to, to talk about these things. But then again, I, I mean, some Kemalist women came after me. I said, oh, my God, 
you know, what's going on here. So they could be very vicious too. Uh, but it's basically just, as I said, uh, creating the space, I think. That's the important thing first. But otherwise, you're absolutely right. It's very hard to do. Maybe that's a good point for us to conclude because one of the things that makes me always more optimistic in the face of great challenge is when I have Ruge Gocek in the room. <laughs> so would you join me in thanking her for this wonderful <laughs>